I uh, definitely appreciate the uh, privilege that it is to be able to have brought you these lectures. And of course, we have one last one for this evening. And so what we want to talk about uh, tonight is we want to talk about uh, what I call unfettered access uh, to evil. But uh, what do we mean by that? Well, as uh, I've noted uh, in the last uh, number of lectures, as of 2010, uh, Google has scanned 25 million of the world's 130 million books. Uh, when you go onto the internet, one of the things that you can do is you can have access to all kinds of services, all kinds of things. You can get uh, places to stay through Airbnb. You can get uh, taxis through Uber, uh, though I couldn't figure out how to use Uber uh, when I was trying to use it a number of months ago, and so I just gave up and quit. Uh, but that's maybe just me. Uh, you can get uh, you know, curated boxes of just about anything that you want, whether it's uh, clothing. Uh, they'll send you a monthly box of clothes for you to try on, and it's specifically tailored for you. Uh, I know of a sock service. Yes, that's right, socks. Uh, so that if you, you imp input all of the information about your particular personality, then they'll send you a curated box of socks just fit for your personality. Uh, you know, uh, pretty interesting. Uh, you know, uh, there's access to shopping. You can go on Amazon and, and purchase just about anything. I remember um, slamming the refrigerator door too, 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 too hard, broke a part in it. I entered in the, the, the general part number. There it popped up on Amazon, was able to order the part, replace it, everything uh, was fine. You can stream movies, you can stream music, you can buy houses and cars. I remember one night lying in bed, uh, you know, looking at uh, the internet. I was bored and I looked at eBay and I, I showed my, my wife. I said, hey, is there any chance that uh, we have $750,000 laying around? And she's like, uh, you know, what do you think? And, and I said, because there's a, there's a Russian MiG fighter here for sale on eBay that I really am interested in. And I was wondering if you thought maybe that'd be okay, if maybe we got it. Um, yeah, you know where that went. But... Um, and even most recently, um, you know, I, you know, I, I ordered like a, a writing box. It's a box for stationery, and I bought it from uh, a shop in uh, in Turkey, in Istanbul, Turkey, and they sent it to me. Uh, and I have like I ordered some um, leather writing pen sleeves. There's leather sleeves for pens, and I ordered a couple of those. They've not yet arrived, and. Right now, my wife doesn't even know that I ordered them, so if she's watching, it's totally necessary, I promise you. Um, but I ordered from somebody in Poland, uh, you, know, I was, you know, so it's just amazing the things that you can access uh, through the internet. Well, Kevin Kelly in his book, uh, The Inevitable, The 12 Technologies That Are Changing Our Future, uh, he describes this phenomenon as accessing, uh, that we have access to all kinds of things. So there are certainly many conveniences that we have because of our access uh, to, in many ways, the world uh, through the internet, whether it's research, research, whether it's shopping, whether it's entertainment. But on the flip side of the coin, uh, we can also say that while we have unfettered access to so many different products and services and, and, and ideas and things on the internet, we also now have unfettered access to all kinds of evil. And so what we want to do is we want to give thought to the fact that we do have unfettered access to evil. And so we're going we're gonna to think first about uh, unfettered access to evil. And then secondly, uh, we want to reflect upon the importance of uh, ultimately finding contentment in Christ. Finding contentment in Christ. So let's give thought first to the idea of unfettered access to evil. In that, uh, in, the, uh, in the old days, uh, we could say before the internet, uh, it used to be that if you wanted to have access, say, to pornography, you had to have the courage to go to some place, whether it was a bookstore or a convenience store, and go pick up the magazine or whatever it was and go to the counter and purchase it. Uh, but now you can have access to these, these kinds of images in the seclusion of your own home. It's just a couple of uh, mouse clicks away. And what I think when it comes to the, a subject like this, we perhaps have a hesit hesitancy to talk about it, uh, but it's an important one because it's definitely a cancer and an infection that even uh, impacts the church. 
Oftentimes, I think we don't realize how powerful this particular industry is. It's a $60 billion per year industry, which means that it has the same financial footprint as the country music industry. So in this sense, it is significant. Uh, you know, to be sure, uh, pornography has been around uh, for thousands of years, but the internet has essentially given us accessibility, affordability, and anonymity. Uh, you can go and, uh, you know, look at this stuff, again, in the privacy of your own home. Hardly anybody might ever know uh, that you are looking at it. Uh, most people probably don't realize how formative uh, the pornography industry has been in terms of influencing the types of technologies that we use. For example, uh, when I was a kid growing up, uh, now this is going to sound maybe foreign to some of the younger folks, you had videotapes. You, know, you may not know what those are, but they had the VHS videotape, and then they had the Betamax videotape, which was produced by Sony. And there was a, there was a, a, a media battle between uh, VHS and Betamax as to which was the preferred uh, media platform, if you will. And uh, Betamax, hands down, was the better, was the better uh, media form, format. Uh, it had better sound and better picture quality, uh, but it was the VHS tape that had the greater capacity. You could uh, record two or more hours of content on VHS tapes, even though it had lower quality in terms of its technological capacities. Well, why is it that VHS beat out Betamax? Uh, because the pornography industry went with VHS and Betamax disappeared from the market. The same trend existed uh, with DVDs. Um, there used to be two formats of DVDs. You had um, uh, HD DVD versus Blu-ray. Well, why is it that Blu-ray run out? Because the pornography industry picked Blu-ray. Um, why is it that we have high-speed uh, bandwidth or high-speed internet access uh, through our homes? Well, it's because uh, people who were wanting to download pornographic movies and what have you uh, petitioned and asked for their local uh, cable companies and what, so that they could get uh, faster internet connections. Uh, so this is, uh, in one sense, it's a prevalent uh, you know, presence uh, in our culture. And sadly, we can say that, unfortunately, Christians are affected by these trends. And these are trends that essentially come to us because of the access that technology gives to us. Nine out of 10 boys and six out of 10 girls have seen pornography by the time that they're 18 years old. Uh, during a Promise Keepers rally, this was a men's movement that existed uh, in the late uh, 20th century in the 1990s. It was attended by thousands. They would fill up uh, stadiums, you know, 30, 40, 50,000 men there, essentially for uh, Bible study and to hear various preachers and, and professors and speakers speak about uh, the Bible and how important it was to be godly men. Well, you would, in, at these Promise Keeper rallies, you could have as many as half of them, you know, half a stadium of men uh, admitting to the fact that they had uh, been purveyors, uh, or I'm sorry, not purveyors, but uh, viewers of pornography. 50% uh, of professing Christian men and 20% of Christian women are addicted to pornography, according to recent studies. And tragically, the most popular day for viewing it, Sunday. Uh, at least according to one study. Christianity Today uh, conducted a survey that revealed that 57% of pastors and 64% of youth pastors uh, were struggling at the present uh, with pornography addictions. This was according to a study done a couple of years ago. Uh, anecdotally, when I was a pastor, uh, when I was a pastor, uh, I had to deal with this problem in my church on several occasions. Uh, you know, I had uh, one family that essentially pornography uh, completely really destroyed the family. It ended up in uh, adultery and divorce. Uh, I had a young woman in my church who had to come to me and she said that uh, she had encountered a, a co-worker uh, who was uh, looking at pornographic images on his computer. She walked into a room and he was looking at the images. She quickly exited. And she said, what should I do? And I said, well, you know, probably best thing to do is to go tell uh, human resources, go tell uh, the people at work what was going on. And so she did. Long story short, uh, he was fired for inappropriate use of company resources. 
The sad thing was is that he was the father of five boys and a ruling elder in a Nay Park church. You know, so this is something that has had detrimental and devastating effects, not only upon our culture, but also upon even the church, even upon the church. However, we can say that pornography is an easy target. It's an easy target. We can readily identify it and we can say that, that it's wrong. But uh, what about more mundane forms of evil, or at least seemingly mundane forms of evil, uh, that technology gives us access to? I think that sometimes we can imbibe from the fountain of evil, if you will, uh, without even realizing it, because the forms of entertainment say that we uh, look at are so common and so pedestrian, at least from a worldly standpoint. Moreover, as we imbibe from you know, various forms of entertainment, might we actually be consorting with the demonic, however unwittingly uh, that we are engaging in such entertainment consumption? You know, we know, for example, of, of Christ's interaction with demons, and thus we have to acknowledge the existence of the demonic. Uh, but I think most people in the West really don't think much of them, perhaps because uh, we have uh, supposedly such an advanced, uh, you know, technological culture. We say, well, sure, certainly those types of things uh, don't exist. You know, as uh, Rudolf Bultmann, famous liberal New Testament scholar in the late 20th century, who said, how can we who live with electric lights and, um, you know, and the telephone and the telegraph and, and all of these other modern conveniences believe in a th three-tiered world, one inhabited by angels and demons? Uh, well, in other parts of the world, uh, they aren't so easily fooled. They acknowledge the existence of the demonic realm. And this is something that we as Christians shouldn't too quickly dismiss. I mean, if it's in the scriptures and Christ interacts with them and casts them out of people, then we should recognize that this is real. This is real. So they are real even if we don't encounter them. Uh, or do we? Or do we? You know, I think we should get out of the mindset that uh, the demonic is... Uh, going to show up with somebody in a red suit with a red cape, horns, uh, and, and a pitchfork. In other words, that it's going to somebody, you know, some sort of creature is going to jump out and say, ha, uh, I'm a demon. And then we would, of course, flee and run for our lives. Um, rather, I think we should recognize that if Paul says that, uh, that Satan can dress himself up as an angel of light, then that means that the demonic can take on rather mundane and ordinary forms or sometimes even uh, the, the false form of truth. In other words, it's a false claim to truth. But in this case, I think we can say that the demonic is often present in common forms of entertainment that we find available and accessible on the internet. Uh, a number of uh, centuries ago, St. Augustine, who lived in the fifth century, St. Augustine he lived in the fifth century. He charged the politicians of Rome with corruption because they promoted what they called the spectacle entertainments, the spectacle entertainments. What were the spectacle entertainments? Well, these were essentially uh, the events and the games and the entertainments that took place, say, for example, in the Roman Colosseum. It was in the Colosseum where you had the gladiator contests. Uh, where two warriors would go into the Colosseum and do battle unto death, where only the live, uh, you know, successful, victorious warrior would emerge out of the Colosseum and that the other would die. They would have uh, hunting animals, uh, you know, right there in terms of as, as sport, not in the sense of hunting them for food like we might do so for today uh, or for thinning out the herd, but rather as a form of entertainment where they would watch animals be hunted and killed there in the Colosseum, just sheerly for entertainment, not for any type of use whatsoever. Sometimes people would go to the Colosseums to observe mass executions. In this particular case, we would have to put the persecution and the martyrdom of Christians as Christians were fed uh, to wild beasts or to lions. This was a form of entertainment in the ancient world in Augustine's day. And what it did is it promoted the idea that essentially life was cheap and bloodshed was essentially a form of entertainment. 
Augustine writes in his City of God, he says, for such demons are pleased with the frenzy of the games, the cruelty of the amphitheater, with the violent contests of those who undertake the strife of controversy. By acting this way, pagans offer incense to the demons with their hearts. So in other words, as the crowds would get whipped up in a frenzy and that they would scream, uh, you know, and in praise and in adulation as they watched people uh, commit violence against one another and they, they found pleasure in this, Augustine says that this is where we would often find, he says, the demonic in the celebration of violence, in the celebration of evil, and in the celebration of death. Under this veil, under this veil, the demonic, at least in Augustine's world, uh, could appear under the everyday, ordinary, mundane events of life. The Roman Colosseum was ordinary. Uh, you know, it was essentially right there for everybody to go to, and, and thousands of people uh, went to observe these forms of entertainment. Well, Augustine saw through the facade. He could see it, if you will, with the eyes of faith in order to see it for what it was. A celebration of evil, a celebration of sin, a celebration of death, that which is the very antithesis of what we read in, of and, and what we hear of in the scriptures. And so this, I think, should cause us to ask the question as we're thinking about these types of things, what in our own culture is mundane? pedestrian, common, you know, we can find it pretty much anywhere. You know, think about the saying, well, everybody's doing it, but yet might it pulsate with the demonic? But it's over, it's got a veil of commonality over it. It's got a veil, say, of entertainment over it. I think we can say that bloodlust is still around and that people to this day, despite our advanced, supposedly technological, progressive society in which we live, they still like to lather their hands in violence as a form of entertainment. It's slick and it's shiny and it's been given a degree of respectability because of the marketing campaigns that are behind it, and it's easily accessible through technology such as the internet. You know, so what, for example, and maybe I make a few people uncomfortable with this, I hope not, I'm just trying to cause us to think carefully about the way that we live our Christian lives. Uh, what about video games, for example, that, that glorify violence? Uh, one of the things I've been reading as of late, uh, in fact, reading it still even as of today, I'm almost through the book, is uh, Lieutenant Colonel Dave Grossman's On Combat. It's about the physiology and the psychology of deadly force encounters. He's also written books such as On Killing, which gets into the psychological side of, of again, deadly force encounters, what that does to us, what is necessary in order to carry, uh, uh, you know, acts of violence out. And he's also written a book called uh, Stop Teaching Our Kids to Kill. And one of the means by which uh, our culture essentially inculcates our youth into violence is through uh, violent media forms, or in this case, even violent video games. Think about ordinary life. You know, whenever, say, you're out on the football field, uh, and uh, you're playing, you can play pretty aggressively at times. And, you know, uh, kids can smash into each other and tackle each other. But what happens as soon as somebody gets hurt? Well, the game stops. And you go out to the field, you maybe take a, a doctor or something like that, and you, you carry the injured person off the field. In other words, with that type of aggressive play, that's okay. Why? Well, because that's where you're learning the limits. You're learning the limits as to uh, not only how aggressively you can play, but also you're learning things like sympathy to say, well, wait a minute, no, that's too far. I shouldn't do that. That's excessive. Somebody's just been injured. Now we need to stop and we need to help this person. You know, you see it happen, uh, Lieutenant Gr Colonel Grossman says, when puppies are wrestling, 
He says, you can see two puppies wrestling really aggressively until one yelps because the puppy's been injured, at least minorly so, and the, the, the two puppies stop, at least for a minute, until one of them can collect himself or herself. Well, not so with violent video games. Not so with violent video games. He says what you're doing is that you're training a mind to perform acts of violence and you don't stop when people get hurt. It's a form of mental habituation. In fact, what's, uh, what, what, what I think gives uh, Colonel Grossman uh, a high degree of respectability in terms of the research and the studies that he's done is that he was a consultant in the shooting case in 1997 in Paducah, Kentucky, where a 14-year-old boy uh, went to his school and there was a, a prayer meeting of students there where he shot uh, eight of his classmates. Uh, five were injured, seriously injured, and three were killed. What's, what, what he says is unreal about this particular incident is that this young boy, 14 years old, had a 100% hit rate. 100% accuracy rate. He, he compares it to an incident where police officers were involved in a shooting uh, where a, there was a suspect who was wielding a gun. And so seven police officers poured 41 shots out of their weapons and only sustained a hit rate of around, I think it was uh, 40%. These are trained police officers, could only hit 40% accuracy. But yet this 14-year-old boy had 100% accuracy. Uh, and it was because the video game trained him. And this is what he says. In fact, what he notes is that the American Medical Association, the American Psychiatric Association, the Ameri Pedi American Pediatric Association all say that there's a direct causal link between youth violence and violent media. Direct link. It should, it should cause us to pause when we recognize that the U.S. Army in the late 90s used uh, training tools developed on a Nintendo game system to train their soldiers to, be greater, to have greater accuracy and to habituate them and to get them used to being able to kill uh, moving targets, in other words, human beings. And so what he calls violent video games is he calls them mass murder simulators. Now, he puts the question out there. He says, well, are you saying that just because I look at, at you know, violent images or, or violent media or, say, violent video games that I'm going to automatically go out and commit murder? He says, no, he's not saying that. But he uses the illustration, and I could definitely identify with it. When I was a kid, I was, uh, say, knee-high to a grasshopper when I was two, do you know where I used to ride in the car? I used to stand on the front seat next to my dad. <laughs> I used to stand on the front seat next to my dad. Uh, and if we came to a sudden stop, you know, he'd stick his arm out so that I wouldn't lurch forward. You know, but I'm sure some of you may have had, say, station wagons or back in the day where you know, on a long road trip, you might sleep on the back ledge, <laughs> you know, because you were small enough. And so you say, well, Nowadays, what do you do? No, you, you buckle them in a five-point safety harness and in a child seat, or you make sure that the kids are buckled up. And so you might say, well, nothing bad happened to me when I was just standing in the front seat on the, on the bench seat of my parents' station wagon, so we don't need to buckle up the kids, right? Well, we wouldn't take that kind of risk when it comes to seat belts and driving in the car now, now that we know better. Well, why would we take the risk when it comes to exposing our young people and our minds to violent video games, for example? Or to put it this way, let me put this in theological terms, that even though the internet gives us access to this type of media, say violent video games, why would we want to practice simulating sin, engaging in acts of violence? Why would we want to do that? Do we search YouTube for violent videos? You know, I, I think a mild form of this, a mild form of this uh, is, uh, I don't know if you've seen these YouTube videos. My kids brought my attention to it. 
I watched one with them and after it made me uncomfortable and I said, you know what? I don't think we should be watching these videos anymore. What are the video series? Um, and I hope you don't go and look them up, <laughs> but I'll mention it. It's called Fail Nation. Have you ever seen those? It's just a series of clips of people falling, tripping, getting hit in the head with balls, you know, falling downstairs, you know, uh, kids on skateboards crashing. And, you know, the first couple of them are funny, I suppose, you know, but then as I begin to think about it, I begin to realize what you're doing when you're watching one of these is you're laughing at people getting injured. And I thought, I don't know that that's really something that's edifying. I don't know that that's a good thing. Might that, in, you know, instill in us a lack of empathy or sympathy so that we see that in real life and we fail to show sympathy for somebody who might get injured in, in a real life accident? You know, so I've told my kids, I said, there's another series of videos that you're more than happy to watch. I say, and it's the video series called People Are Awesome. <laughs> and it shows people doing amazing things, feats, you know, sports, juggling, walking on their hands, flips, you know, off the diving board, just doing all kinds of amazing things. I say, you know, why don't we celebrate that? You know, it's like the Apostle Paul says, in Philippians chapter 4, verses 8 and following, finally, finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. You know, when the internet gives us unfettered access to evil, uh, we ought to think twice about what it is that we're looking at. You know, it's a, it seems like a silly children's song to us, but perhaps you've heard the song, uh, be careful little hands what you touch, be careful little feet where you go, be careful little eyes what you see, be careful little eyes what you see. You know, there's scores of these things, uh, of, of videos online. It's like when I was a kid, there was a form of video, I will not mention the name just because this is a much more, I think, uh, you know, uh, uh, evil form of so-called entertainment and that uh, it, it, it showed instances of animals being killed, of people dying in car accidents. And uh, I remember my pastor talking about the videotape uh, from the pulpit saying that it was demonic. And now that video is available online. And I, when I checked, it had 1.2 million views. Now, keep in mind, I'm not, for, I'm not condemning in any way all forms of online entertainment or the access that the internet gives us to so many different benefits, services, and good forms of entertainment. But I, I do think that what we need to do is we need to ask, why am I watching this? Why am I accessing this? Whatever it may be. What am I accessing? You know, what forms of entertainment am I accessing and for what purpose? Is it building me up or is it somehow uh, tearing me down? And so this brings us to our second point, uh, which is finding our contentment in Christ. And this is, I think, vital. And it's, I think, Ben, you can tell a sub-theme throughout uh, the, all of these lectures as I've delivered them, is that in a sin-fallen world, what, uh, what sinners have done is they've taken two things that God has created as good, sexuality and life, and they've twisted them and turned them upside down so that they exchange the truth of God for a lie. So sexuality becomes perversion, and death is something that we celebrate instead of recognizing that death is our enemy. It is our enemy. And it is the very thing for which Christ, the Son of God, became incarnate to deliver us from. So why would we in any way celebrate it or treat it as a form of entertainment? So keeping this in mind and that seeking ultimately our contentment in Christ so that we wouldn't try to seek to fill that Christ-shaped hole in our hearts with anything else, any other substitute, even when it comes to our forms of entertainment, uh, how can we respond to this so that we can ensure that we fill our hearts with Christ and with things that are good, with things that are beautiful, things that exude excellence? 
Well, I think we can approach it from three different vantage points. We can say first, discernment. Secondly, detachment. And then third, contentment. I couldn't think of a third D word, <laughs> okay? So discernment, detachment, and contentment. I, I looked for synonyms with, that started with a D for contentment, and maybe you can think of one. I couldn't. But let's start first with the discernment. You know, again, uh, as Paul writes there in Philippians 4.8, you know, think about the things that you're accessing, through whatever means of technology it is, whether it's through the internet, whether it's through your phone, whether it's through your television, or perhaps whether it's through the books that you read, whatever the technology it might be, you know, are these things good things? Are they good things? Does our entertainment, do the movies, do the, does the music, the images, do they bring out the best in us? Or do they bring out the worst of us? Do they tempt us with sin? Or do they cause us to think about virtues? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. And so sifting through the internet, I think, for example, requires a hearty knowledge of God's law and a heavy dose of wisdom. I think this is sometimes one of the biggest missing categories as we engage the Christian life. We know the law. Don't do this. But so often in life, we look at something and we might think, huh, it seems like it's a gray area. I'm not quite sure what I should do. Is, is this something I should listen to? Is this something I should read? Is this something I should watch? And what it calls for is wisdom. And it's like I, I tell my students, I can give you in a rule book everything that you need to know on how to play baseball. You can know how to score a run. You can know that you're allowed to steal bases. You know, you can learn about the infield fly rule. Uh, you can learn about double plays. But what that rule book is not going to tell you is uh, when's the best time to steal second? When's the best time to bunt? Uh, when's the best time to switch pitchers? Now, obviously, if your pitcher is giving away a lot of runs, that's a good time, you know? The other day I saw that the Braves beat, I think it was the Marlins, and they scored like 29 runs. It looked like a football score, not a baseball score. You know, but I can remember back in the 90s watching the Braves uh, when they were frequently in the playoffs. And uh, as somebody who didn't have a great appreciation for the finer elements of the sport, it used to drive me nuts when Bobby Cox, the manager, would switch from a right-handed pitcher to a left-handed pitcher because the batter changed. The batter went from a light righty or to a lefty. I was like, oh, who cares? Just let the man pitch. Does it really matter all that much? Well, that's where it calls for a wisdom in knowing how best to play the game, what strategies to use. In other words, where there aren't explicit rules and you have to learn how to play within the boundaries of the rules, it's knowing best how to work within those boundaries. And that's where Christian wisdom comes in, is when the Word of God doesn't give us an explicit uh, piece of instruction to say, thou shalt not watch any PG movies. Or thou shalt not watch any R-rated movies. It's like I used to tell people in my church, there are some G-rated movies that I would say you should not watch, or that aren't good things for you to, to focus your mind upon. And conversely, there may be some R-rated movies uh, that are about important historical events that may be worthwhile watching, maybe not for younger minds, younger eyes, younger viewers, but for mature, uh, you know, adults or something like that, that this would be something that would expose them to important truths of history. And so therefore, it would be something that would be important to watch. You know, so you, you have to use wisdom. 
You have to use wisdom. So discernment, using the wisdom of Christ to discern in those gray areas of life what things you should be consuming in terms of your entertainment, in terms of the information that you're taking in and accessing through technologies such as the internet. The second thing I think we could say is detachment. Detachment. Pornography is sinful, plain and simple. You know, Jesus says in Matthew 5, 28, but I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. You know, the, the negative effects of pornography on the mind have been well documented. There are psychological, uh, you know, negative things that occur to the mind with the use of pornography. They are mentally, physically, and spiritually destructive we must detach ourselves from it entirely. Again, Jesus says in the very next verse, if your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away, for it's better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown in hell. You know, so the question is, is let's say you're struggling with this. Um, and uh, you say, okay, I need to, det to detach myself from this. Well, how, how do I go about that? Well, if you're using your smartphone, get a dumb phone. You know, I've seen these phones, and I don't know why they're in magazines that I like to read, which maybe tells me that I'm getting older in age, but they're phones advertised for the elderly with large numbers on them. And that, you know, here, get this phone for grandma, and it's just one, you know, it's just got the nine numbers on it. It's very simple. Get a dumb phone if your smartphone is the problem. Get someone who you trust to help hold you accountable that you'd be willing to say, yeah, sure, you can do a search on my computer, in my search history, anything you want. You can look at it anytime you want. Please help me, hold me accountable, brother in Christ. Uh, if necessary, I'm not saying that you have to do this, but if it's necessary, maybe disconnect the cable. Disconnect the cable. But this is where we have to remember that fleeing from evil is only half of the equation. Fleeing from evil is only half of the equation. It was one time where I was uh, interacting with a gentleman at my church, and he says, hey, after church, uh, you know, can we uh, go out and get a cup of coffee? And I was like, okay, fine, I don't drink coffee. You can get the coffee, I'll get some water. That's my typical line. I'm very boring when it comes to beverages. And so as I got in his car, I looked at his dashboard, and I thought, oh, wow, I'm so sorry to see this. I guess somebody broke into your car and hacked up the dashboard to steal your, your, your stereo system. And he says, no. He says, I did that. I was like, what? You did this? What do you mean? He says, well, my, I was listening to my radio and I was listening to music and it was causing me uh, to, um, to sin. Uh, and so I, uh, I hacked out my radio with an ax. And I was like, oh. And it, you know, I started looking in the back seat to make sure that the ax still wasn't back there because I was like, all of a sudden I was really worried. And I wanted to say, I, I didn't have the guts to say this, but I really wanted to say, did you ever try thinking about pulling the fuse? Uh, or maybe, you know, getting a screwdriver and uninstalling the radio and just putting it up on the shelf in your garage rather than hacking your dashboard to pieces? The problem is, is that you can hack your dashboard to pieces and you can haul, you know, your, your, your stereo system out of your car. But the problem is, is that you still carry the lust in your heart. What Jesus says, it's not what goes into a person that makes a person unclean, uh, but rather it's what comes out of a person, out of his heart. For out of his heart comes lust and covetousness and, and the desire to steal and to lie. It's out of the heart. So unless we change our hearts, there's no way ultimately really that we're going to get detached from the things with which we struggle when we're accessing these various things through the technologies in our life. How is it that we change our hearts? It's only through uh, the gospel of Christ. Only through the gospel of Christ. In other words, what you have to do is uh, you have to displace the, the temptation and the sin with the holiness of Christ. You know, when I, when I help the wife with the dishes, which sometimes she appreciates, sometimes she doesn't. Sometimes she'll hold up something and go, this doesn't look clean. And I'm like, no, no, I, I washed it. She's like, it still feels greasy, <laughs> right? So I try to help the wife when I can, and I try to do a good job. But I've discovered that when I'm doing dishes, 
uh, when it comes time to, for example, washing out a water bottle, um, I, you know, you'll sit there and you, you wash it on the inside and then you start rinsing. And every time you rinse it, it, it would still have soap suds in it and it would drive me nuts. But I found out this, is that if you set the water bottle at the bottom of the sink and just let the water flow directly into it until the water fills up the water bottle, it pushes out the soap suds. And then you dump out the water and you're done. It works great first time, love it. That's the way we have to work in our hearts. What we have to do is we have to stand beneath the stream of the grace of the gospel of Christ that we access through the means of grace so that it would so fill our hearts and push out that which does not belong, that which is sinful. You know, because otherwise what we end up finding ourselves doing is we try to fill up the cup and then we dump it out to try to get the, the sin out and we see that it's still sticking to the edges of our heart. So discernment, detachment, but last but not least, contentment. You know, because we have unfettered access to all sorts of evil, I think we can and should take the necessary steps to flee from sin and to pursue Christ. According to the psalmist, the psalmist says in Psalm 107, verse 9, for he satisfies the longing of the soul and the hungry soul he fills with good things. You know, only when God displaces our sinful desires with a godly passion for Christ will we find peace. So despite the ease of access, I think we'll be able to smile and walk past it and say, I'm not interested. I have a contentment in Christ. I have peace in Christ. I don't need the violence. I don't need the illicit images. I don't want these things because I want Christ more. I want Christ more. Again, as Augustine says, O oh Lord, you have created us for, our, for yourself, and we long to be filled with you, and our hearts are restless until we find contentment in you. So in conclusion, you know, technology has given us great access great access to many, many wonderful things. So I'm not here to decry the access that, say, the internet gives us to so many things, so many wonderful things. You know, but it also gives us unfettered access to bad things. And so we have to use a scripturally informed, discerning, wise mind as we use the technologies in our life. We must be willing to detach ourselves uh, from evil things even the seemingly mundane, even the seemingly mundane, you know, we have to get out of the mindset, well, everybody's doing it. It's okay, right? No, no. Inform your conscience by the word of God. And then in the end, we must pray that by God's grace, he would grant us a contentment in Christ so that we would not, you know, continue wandering hither, thither, and yon, always looking for the next thing to try to give us contentment and satisfaction when the only one in whom we will ever find that contentment is in the Lord Jesus Christ. Great. Thanks so much for all of your attentiveness over these last number of weeks. It's been a real joy and a privilege uh, to be able to, to deliver these materials to you, and I, I do hope that in the end these talks have encouraged us all to really be discerning users uh, of technology. Thanks so much.